Hey, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I would like to welcome you to the licensed seminar for Albin Engholm, uh, where he will defend his licensed thesis, Driverless Trucks in the Swedish Freight Transport System, an analysis of future impacts on the transport system and the uh, emerging innovation system. Um, and we have uh, two more key persons here. Uh, during this session, we have uh, Maria Oskott from uh, Lindholmen Science Park. Uh, she's also program director for Triple F, which is the Swedish initiative for fossil free freight transport system. And she is the opponent for today and will ask Albin questions. Uh, and also behind the camera here, we have the examiner, uh, Jonas Mortensson. And he's uh, associate professor at the Division of Decision and Control Systems here at KTH. And he will also ask Alvin questions uh, later during the session. So this session, uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm Anna Pernestol, and I have had the honor to be the supervisor for Alvin uh, during, his, uh, during his work. So in the session today, we will start with Alvin presenting his, uh, his work in about 20 minutes. Uh, and after that, we will follow with questions from uh, Maria Oskott, uh, the opponent. Uh, after that, we will give the word to uh, Jonas Mortensson, the examiner uh, for the session. And after that, we open up for the audience to ask questions. Uh, and then you can either ask questions by raising your hand and we will uh, or, or you can write the questions in the chat. But we take that uh, again in detail when we are there. So with that, I yeah, hand over to Albin and uh, please uh, present your work to us. Thank you very much, Anna. And let's see if we can get this clicker to work here. So yes, welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for joining in. Today I will present research on an area which, in my view, has been a bit strangely overlooked in the literature so far. That is how automated driving technology can affect freight transport systems. And more specifically, I have studied driverless trucks in the Swedish freight transport system, and this is also the uh, title of my licensed thesis. So the purpose of this presentation now will be both to give an overview and summary of the research for the ones of you who have not yet read the thesis, so I will make a quite shallow, but rather comprehensive summary of the research and the findings. But for you who have also read the thesis, uh, I hope to be able to give maybe some more nuance and some more clarity on the findings. So I think it's fair to say that driverless trucks has been an area where there's been a rapid development the last decade or so, and maybe in particular the last four or five years, uh, both if we look on the technology side of things, but also on the market side with substantial amount of pilot projects and demonstration projects and even commercial products being deployed uh, worldwide, but also here in Sweden. I would say it's more or less a common view in the automated vehicle sector that uh, freight transport applications, and maybe in particular long haulage heavy truck applications, could be the first uh, transportation domain where we could have a large scale um, introduction of driverless vehicles for both technical and market uh, based reasons. And while it's very, very challenging to make timelines on automated vehicle technology, we have seen those fail quite many times in the past. Uh, still, some of the more trustworthy sources um, claim that it's quite likely that we can see driverless trucks being deployed for some specific types of, of freight transport applications well before 2030. And also, I think it's fair to say that driverless trucks do target some of the critical uh, industrial challenges for, for the transport sector, which I will come into a bit more. So this is a technology that could possibly have a quite substantial impact in a rather short period of time on the freight transport system, which is uh, in several ways, a very important system. If we look on the uh, road freight transport sector in Sweden, it employs almost 70,000 persons. It's a big economic sector. However, it uh, is ch challenged by very low profit margins. Uh, the last number I saw from the Swedish Transport uh, Company Association was that the profit margins are around 2% on average. And it's also very fragmented. Uh, the average number of employees in the sector is, is less than eight persons per company. So it's quite, uh, it's dominated by small companies with quite limited financial resources. And also labor related costs is by far the biggest cost post for these companies. Driver related costs amount to around 40% of total costs. From the societal perspective, heavy trucks, uh, which I here define as trucks heavier than 3.5 tons, maximum permissible weight, 
they constitute the backbone of the freight transport system in many ways. But they're also a big, uh, big emitter of greenhouse gas emissions with a sizable share, both of the uh, transport emissions in Sweden, but also the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Sweden. And we have an ample challenge of, of uh, fully decarbonizing this sector in two, two decades, especially uh, considering that we also have an, a forecasted uh, growth in road transport demand by around almost 50% uh, until 2040, at least we trust traffic records latest forecast. So with this new technology that, that's coming, uh, I think it's fair to say that we have some important uh, questions to ask ourselves what this means for society and how should uh, transportation planners and policymakers uh, understand this development and, and do they need to do anything about it? Um, this is of course a very overarching question, but I think it's <laughs> quite problematic. There's, there's a huge research gap here. I started working on this thesis in 2018 and back then you can find almost no systematic studies looking at what I call driverless trucks uh, and their impacts on, on the transport system. It has improved a little bit, but still I think we are lagging behind quite substantially. And it, in particular, if you compare to, to automated vehicles in passenger transport, where we had a lot of very useful simulation-based studies, which have provided excellent uh, guidance to, uh, yeah, to inform the, the debate. And we don't have that for freight transport. I think a very important role for academia here is to provide a critical view on this technology and its impacts and the potential benefits of it. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to have material to challenge or confirm if, if, if that's uh, what we should do, uh, the technology narratives from the industry. And again, comparing with, with passenger transport where we've had really use, I think, of this interesting research and system level research, which has been able to provide a much more nuanced debate about the potential for this technology than what we had, yeah, four or five years ago. And I think the current, where we are at right now and kind of what, what's needed in this field is first of all, to provide Kind of a basic understanding of this technology and its potential impacts for, for policy and planning uh, and give some kind of at least order of magnitude estimate of what the effects could be uh, because there's so little research done right now so that's kind of where we're at that is also i need i think for kind of some just groundwork that can direct future more specialized research in the field um, so these are some of the reasons for why i decided to to spend a lot of my time on this topic and I, this thesis is my kind of very humble attempt to start addressing some of these issues. So the scope for my thesis, we can, we can start by looking at what I define as a driverless truck in the thesis. Uh, and first of all, when I talk about trucks here uh, in the remainder of the presentation and in the thesis, I talk about heavy trucks. Uh, and I focus mainly on long haulage applications. So not the urban distribution. Uh, and there are several reasons for that, but uh, I, I refer you to the thesis to, to uh, for a more detailed uh, detail uh, reasons for that. But a driverless truck is defined as, it has an automated driving system that is capable of performing automated driving uh, within either a restricted or an unrestricted operational domain. But to the definition, you also have a, the hard condition that there should be no driver in the truck. However, there could be a human in the loop uh, by remote support. So in a control tower or other remote operation center. And I mean, a driverless truck can receive re uh, remote support in many different ways. But it, it doesn't completely then disallow a human to be in the loop somehow. Uh, a very important, I think, just clarifying uh, aspect is that a driverless truck could be either SA level four, but without a driver in the truck. So it's kind of only operated within the domain the automated driving system is designed for, or an SA level five truck. So this means that in this sense, the span of what a driverless truck could be, according to my definition, is pretty broad. It can be both a very specialized application, but it can also have uh, and just be used for a specific type of transport flow, but it can also be this kind of multi-purpose tool that two trucks are, manually driven trucks are today. So this is what I'm studying. And the overarching aim of the thesis is to build knowledge on this topic, uh, and in, more in particular on how an introduction of driverless trucks could materialize and impact the freight transport system in Sweden. And I target two objectives. The first one is to analyze the impacts of driverless trucks on the freight transport system when they're available and on the market. So in the future, at some point, uh, when the technology is mature. So that's kind of an assumption we'll make there. And I studied this in two papers, paper one and paper two. Uh, in paper one, we focus on how uh, total cost of ownership can be affected by driverless trucks. And we use those findings for paper two, where we do an analysis of how the freight transport system might respond if this technology was available. 
So here we take a transport economic perspective and the approach of users kind of to isolate the impacts of automated driving and not uh, look on like other parallel uh, technological development like electrification and so on, which is quite important when you interpret the results here. The second objective is to uh, analyze the development and the ongoing development towards introducing driverless trucks in Sweden. So this is done in paper three, where we take a quite different approach. We take a so broader social technical perspective and we look on what is characterizing the innovation system of driverless trucks. And I will, I will dig in a bit more to that later. So now I will present the, the papers uh, one by one and make a short summary of them. Uh, and then I will make a conclusion and some discussion in the end. So paper one uh, was published almost a year ago now. I wrote it together with my supervisors on the panel stall the next stop Michon. And as I said before, here we're interested in how total cost of ownership for trucks can uh, change when they become driverless compared to current manually driven trucks. So we used TCO, total cost of ownership, which is a quite commonly used approach to kind of evaluate the cost performance of various vehicle technologies. The intention with total cost of ownership analysis is to capture kind of all the costs, all the types of costs that uh, a vehicle owner has during the vehicle life cycle, uh, or the vehicle, not the life cycle, but the, during the ownership period, I should say. And this TCO model we have used uh, includes fixed costs, so costs that are independent on whether, if, or how much you use and operate the truck. We have a distance cost component, which you can understand as a marginal cost for operating the truck uh, another kilometer. A similar uh, time cost, cost for uh, the next operating hour or for an additional operating hour. And we also have costs that relate to loading and unloading of the truck. Uh, so cost uh, yeah, in the terminals, uh, so to speak. So what we do is that we calculate the total cost of ownership for, um, yeah, for manually driven trucks as a baseline. We do this for four different truck types of various sizes, so from 16 tons up to 60 tons of maximum permissible weight. We then review the literature. Uh, on how automated driving can affect all of these different cost components. And we have created three uh, cost scenarios for driverless trucks, uh, which we then analyze. So one pessimistic scenario, one uh, base or intermediate scenario, and one optimistic scenario. And I will not go into details all these parameters now, but basically the idea has been that when we reviewed the literature, there was a very wide variety on how these different parameters could, could uh, affect, uh, and I mean, even for individual parameters was a quite big discrepancy. Uh, so the intention with these um, scenarios has been to kind of capture some kind of span here, a, a kind of plausible outcome span. So I don't have time to go into a lot of their findings, but I think you can summarize the findings with this um, figure here. So here we see the total cost of ownership per ton kilometer, uh, which we've used as kind of a functional unit to make it a bit more simple to compare it. And here the, the costs here are normalized per, per truck type. So you can think of this as a relative change in cost. So the gray bar here is the manually driven truck baseline. And then you have the three driverless cost scenarios here in various shades of blue. So what we can conclude from this is, first of all, that there is a substantial cost decrease, uh, even for the pessimistic scenario uh, for all truck types, but also that there's a very large variation in this uh, uh, metric here, total cost of ownership per ton kilometer. So we have a broad range of, of possible outcomes and it's a bit hard to interpret what they mean. And one way is to think of this as it's quite uncertain how kind of cost efficient this technology will be. Another way could be to see this as possibly different development stages or different level of technology maturity that maybe kind of, you know, during when, when we grow uh, our experience in, in, in both on the production side of the technology, but also the operational side, uh, the cost maybe can decrease somewhat like this. Just a detail also, but I think that's interesting is that we can see a small trend that there's uh, relatively speaking, larger cost decreases for smaller truck types than for larger truck types. So this maybe could mean that we see a tendency for a reduced economy of scale effects uh, between truck types or that favors larger truck types. So possibly driverless uh, vehicles might make smaller truck types uh, a little bit more attractive compared to, to uh, large truck types. And I think that's quite interesting if you look on the development, which has been really pushing for bigger and heavier trucks. Going forward then to paper two, here we're instead interested in, um, given that, that uh, the costs for road transport can change quite substantially or the production costs could change, that should uh, reasonably also uh, at some point at least impact the, the price for road transport. And that is one factor that could make driverless trucks have quite a substantial impact on how the transport system is organized. 
So we are assessing this in paper two, uh, which is currently under review at the uh, Transportation Research Part A. I will uh, start taking care of that review actually tomorrow after this uh, seminar here. But I also written this paper then together with my supervisors, Ida and, and Anna. And here we're interested to understand this development on the kind of national freight level, uh, freight system level. So it's, it's, we have done this analysis for the whole of Sweden and we're interested in, in questions like, um, how will freight transport pattern change? Will we see modal shifts as a result from driverless trucks and how will it affect the total system costs? So when doing this type of analysis, I think there are several very important uh, kind of dimensions of, of uncertainty that you need to think about carefully. Uh, we've chosen to focus on two of those in, in our paper here. One is to what extent driverless trucks will actually be able to decrease cost for road transport, what I covered in paper one. The other one is a little bit more tricky, but it has to do with uh, the capabilities of the technology uh, and the kind of operating domain that the technology might have. So it's quite unlikely that we, at least in the short to mid term, will have driverless trucks that you can just use as a substitute to manually driven trucks. Probably you can only use driverless trucks in certain parts of the transport system, which kind of needs you to have a very specific operating model for these trucks. So we assess one of these that have been discussed in the literature, it's called a hub to hub model. And it means that, or in our case, at least it means that you have driverless trucks that are capable of driving between logistics terminals, but you can't have a transport chain starting or ending with a driverless truck. So the driverless truck can take care of the middle mile here, but you then need to do a transfer uh, to access that truck, which of course then costs money. So it's a trade off here if it's worthwhile of using a driverless truck, but you can save money here during the middle mile. So here driverless trucks becomes kind of a complement rather than a substitute to manually driven trucks. And then in the other type of scenario we study, we look way beyond in the future where you could possibly have driverless trucks that could substitute manually driven trucks. So here also giving the model that we use and what you can do with it, we, we have to assume that there's 100% penetration of driverless trucks in the fleet. And we do this analysis by using uh, Trafik Verket's national freight transport model called SAMGOT. Um, and this model is typically used for, for uh, forecasting purposes and for like infrastructure evaluation. So in our case, we have for the first time tried to use this model to uh, simulate the impacts of driverless trucks or model the impacts of driverless trucks. Um, the model intends to capture the whole Swedish freight transport system, meaning that it covers transport flows, like domestic flows within starting and ending in Sweden, but also import and export flows. And it also covers all transport modes. Um, so we can here get kind of a system level assessment. And what we do in the model is that it, it seeks the kind of uh, minimal costs for each freight transport flow. So we kind of assume that, that the behavior of the actors in the system is to minimize the total logistics cost per freight flow. Just very quickly, but I think this is important for, for interpreting the results that what we actually model in some goods is just a part of all the decisions and all the structure that kind of collectively in a very complex way determine uh, the actual freight transport activities. So some got a bit simplified, but it, it operates on this lowest level here, uh, the actual freight transport decisions. So given that we already have a, a fixed structure for, for um, production and consumption patterns, so the trade pattern, economic patterns, and also kind of a um, existing logistic structure, uh, it kind of then optimizes the freight transport decisions within that structure. So we do not capture effects uh, from driverless trucks that could happen on these higher levels. And I think that is very important because at least in the long term, uh, it's possible, I can't say it from the data we have here, but it's possible that the biggest effects will be, will be there. So what you see here is just the, the outcomes of this lowest level here. Uh, just quickly, we look on two types of scenarios, as I explained, hub to hub and all driverless. Uh, we use the 2017 scenario, uh, the traffic card has the kind of official standard scenario for 2017 as a baseline. And then we modify that scenario to, to get, get our driverless truck scenarios. We also do, uh, I call them sensitivity <laughs> scenarios, maybe that's not the right term, but alternative scenarios where we vary the cost levels for driverless trucks for both of these scenarios. And for the hub to hub model, we also kind of evaluate the influence of further res restricting where driverless trucks can operate. So we restrict them in one scenario to only operate on the European highway network, Europa Vägar in Swedish. And in the other scenario, we test what, what would happen if we had a hub to hub solution only uh, in Sweden within the borders of Sweden. I will not have time to explain this, I realize now, so I'll skip this about how we implemented this. But some key results. Uh, yes, we do see that there will be a substantial modal shifts uh, when, we, when we introduce driverless trucks. And there will be shifts from, uh, from rail and sea to road. 
So the size of this effect, uh, I mean, all this number should be taken with a pinch of salt because there's a lot of uncertainty here, but in the all driverless scenario, there's an increase by road ton kilometers in Sweden by 22%, and we get around half of that effect in a hub to hub scenario. Looking at vehicle kilometers, interestingly, those grow almost 50% more, uh, relatively speaking, than the ton kilometers, uh, which is both interesting and, and could possibly be, be problematic. And the effect on the system cost is also quite substantial. Um, also, take these numbers with a pinch of salt, but, but uh, a decrease are on 8% in all driverless scenario and by 5% in the hub to hub scenario, which is uh, more than 1 billion euro per year in both of these scenarios. So the model finds a quite, quite much lower cost level for, for the transit system. Looking at this geographically, um, um, this is kind of aggregated tone flows on the, on the transport network for the different modes. Uh, dark colors here represent an, an increase and light colors a decrease. But uh, what I think is kind of just fast takeaway now <laughs> will be that there's a big, big effect that we see that, that import and export flows are affected and a much bigger volumes of freight going uh, in from Europe or out to Europe and the world will be on road uh, combined with, with ferry transport than it is today. So it replaces a lot of the international sea and rail transport. We also have results on how this affects individual uh, uh, different types of commodities. I will not find to present them now, but they're in the thesis of the paper. And we can also look on how, how the kind of use of different transport modes uh, vary depending on different transport distances. And what you can say is that driverless truck really kind of pushes the, the distances for where road transport is competitive against rail and sea. So it's quite interesting in my opinion. Um, what we also see is that when we look at all these scenarios that we simulated or that we modeled, uh, these are very aggregate results, but the, the um, full bar here represents the, the ink or the change in, in domestic road ton kilometer and the pattern bar represents the change in, in system costs. So just, it's interesting, I think, to see the kind of span of outcomes in these scenarios. And what we see, first of all, an, an interesting observation is that it doesn't really make a big difference here for this hub to hub model if we restrict the driverless trucks to only drive on the European highway network. It most probably has to do with that the terminals that you need for access, uh, uh, these trucks are already located there, but still it's an interesting finding. We also see that if you have a very cost efficient hub to hub system, uh, it seems to generate kind of the same effects as the all driverless model with the slightly less cost competitive trucks, which could indicate that this could be a, a, a feasible model. Um, yeah, I think I should go very quickly here, but is then this a big effect? I think that's an important question. Is this a big effect or not? Well, if it would happen overnight, uh, sorry for my very bad animation here, but yes, it would be uh, a quite substantial jump. It's not super dramatic, but it's a substantial effect. But however, the introduction and impacts of driverless trucks, it's definitely not a discrete event. It's a development that will take time. And, and uh, just the adoption of this technology can take quite a lot of time. And this graph is from a master thesis product I just uh, had where we looked on this. How, how rapid could the uptake of this technology be? And due to this, I mean, this is a development that will happen during several decades. And there may be all sorts of compounding, complementary, and counteracting effects. It's hard to say what the kind of final impact on transport demand will be, because we need to also make the analysis with the other potential, the both like exogenous economic development, but also technological development that can happen in the meantime. And then an aspect that we haven't looked so much on, but I think is very important is that here we've done an analysis on how the kind of current freight transport system with the existing structure could change. But it's also likely, and it relates to the table I showed before, that introducing driverless trucks will also change the kind of structure, both of logistics system, but also on uh, trade patterns, and also probably the, the business logic in the freight transport sector. And this is effects that we cannot really capture here with this work, but that might also be a substantial effect in an area for future research. So I will make a short summary also of paper three. Uh, I have decided not to go into details here because I think the kind of benefit of this paper is the nuance that we can provide. And I think you actually need to read the paper to get full nuance here. Uh, but this paper looks on a completely different type of question. It looks on how the innovation system focused on developing this technology here in Sweden, how it operates and what characterizes it and trying to understand the kind of current, current development. Uh, yeah, I should also say that uh, two master thesis students that I supervised, um, Anna Björkman and Yuri Uwilson made very big contributions to this work. 
and we used something called technological innovation systems a framework to study this uh, it aims to understand uh, how an innovation system is acting and operating and also to make normative assessments of how well uh, it is it is capable of delivering the technology um, yes i will i will skip the, the explanation of this but it's a very interesting and useful framework and anna bergeka chalmers has been uh, paramount in developing this uh, this framework but this paper is based on 20 expert interviews with actors in the freight transport system. Uh, in the sample, we focused on uh, breadth rather than depth. So the findings are quite sensitive to the actual interviewees that we have in the sample of the interviews. Uh, but we were able to cover quite a broad span of different type of actors, which I think was very interesting and important in this case. We were able to identify uh, on a very uh, broad level. I mean, first of all, we can conclude that, well, there is actually an innovation system for driverless trucks in Sweden. That is not, uh, of course, um, I mean, it's not obvious that it would be. And it's quite now in a very immature stage and there's kind of a lot of role seeking going on and there's a lot of uncertainty. So we also focus quite a lot on what, what are the actual uncertainties that these actors and the system is facing. But I really uh, encourage you to read the paper for getting the full findings here. Um, yeah, I realized I talked way too long, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, but yes, trying to wrap up with some conclusions and a little bit of ideas of my future work uh, that I can build from this work. So just to try to summarize the findings. Uh, first research question, how automated driving will impact the total cost of ownership? It's likely that there could be significant total cost of ownership reduction in our intermediate scenario around the range of 30 to 40 percent per ton kilometer, quite substantial. However, it's a very large variation between the scenario and a high degree of uncertainty here with the numbers. But the cost increase is quite robust to changes in individual parameters. You could increase the, the purchase cost of the truck with more than 230 percent uh, without canceling the savings here. So if you can make a truck truly driverless, uh, it's quite yeah, robust uh, that you will have a cost increase, so to speak. The second research question, what this means for the freight transport system? Well, we can um, conclude that there will most probably be quite significant modal shifts from rail, uh, uh, from rail to road and sea. This is written wrong here, from rail and sea to road. Um, we can also conclude that this type of hub to hub operating model might actually be quite feasible. And I think we're also, we're quite uh, tough on that model, so to speak. We're, we're having quite high costs for transfer. So I think we're, if anything, maybe underestimating the potential of that in our simulations. And there's also big the potential for, for reducing uh, system costs, but these are internalized costs, so to speak. Uh, think what happens with, with societal costs and benefits. And I think that's a big area that we really need to do further research on. And the final research question about the innovation system. Well, it's characterized by, by low maturity and it's really driven and, and seeking around these key uncertainties that we identified. And a lot of the activities um, are focused on kind of, you know, coping with these uncertainties. And I think we're, we're, it's, which is also why we see kind of a lot of role seeking and a lot of focus on getting together and, and kind of using these innovation networks where we have um, a lot of like partnership building and, and collaboration across organizations. Um, and other interesting observation when we look at it from a political perspective and how this is kind of pushed for from, from uh, the politics side is that there's really this clash between is this industry po politics to kind of support our vehicle manufacturers and our telecom companies and so on? Is it therefore we should push for driverless trucks or is it because we actually see this as a technology that can bring actual uh, transport system benefits and societal benefits? And those two quite often get mixed up in the narrative around this technology. Um, just some quick self-critique, and I think some of the important caveats for this research. Um, first of all, in paper one and paper two, we really try to isolate automated driving from other effects. Um, so I think one can really question to what extent am I studying future impacts on the transport system, as I kind of suggest in the, in the subtitle. Um, maybe it's something to discuss with you later, Maria. <laughs> uh, but we also isolate kind of the driving task from other parts of the logistics chain. And I think that's very important because Driverless trucks mean that we need to change all kinds of logistics processes, everything from loading and unloading the vehicle, uh, fault detection, all of that where the driver has a crucial role today. Um, we're not really including that in the analysis. And I think that is a very important topic. Um, just very quickly, but this, all this kind of analysis is, is, is kind of characterized by so much uncertainty and it's very hard to know uh, what you're omitting from your analysis. And that's something we really have struggled with. And, and uh, I think there's, 
really a need to think deeply and thoroughly about what this means for your analysis and, and that there's a lot of improvements to do um, here and also to use maybe other types of methodologies which are more kind of capable of representing and analyzing uncertainty than the ones we have used. And just to be very clear, this research here is it's not a forecast at all. Uh, and that's very important. This gives us some indication and some kind of glimpse into, okay, what could driverless trucks mean? But this is far from something that we can use directly for planning or policy purposes, but it can provide some guidance. And going from kind of the level we're at now to be able to actually do some kind of forecast or foresight, maybe is a better word for this, uh, requires, um, I think, some methodological developments here. First, to actually include a combined effects with other developments in this sector, but maybe more importantly, that probably time dynamics matter when things happen here matters. Uh, an introduction of driverless trucks in 2028 will have probably quite different impacts on, uh, for instance, climate, uh, the potential to reach climate targets compared to if it would happen in 2048. And also how fast this uptake will also kind of determine quite a lot on how disruptive this development will be. Uh, so I hope to be able to address some of these issues in the work I plan for the future. Uh, it will be about using an approach called exploratory modeling and analysis, where we use, instead of using a very detailed transport model for making a few scenarios, we try to make simple models, but where we can instead kind of run thousands or millions of scenarios where we can start playing with these uncertainties and really seeing the kind of full outcome space, just instead of just looking at one or a few scenarios. Um, and this kind of <laughs> idea to do this kind of research really grew from the from the kind of reflections on the work we have done here, where we have li really limited to like the isolation of driverless trucks and just look at a few scenarios. So I, I think that the research I've done so far stands on its own, but I think it will be even more interesting when we can use it uh, and apply it to this uh, type of methods. So I, I talked way too long, I think, but uh, if you want to know more, you will have the opportunity to ask a question later at the seminar. Uh, I encourage you to read the thesis and the papers, and you can also email me. And maybe most important of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you who contributed to the work to my supervisors, uh, Anna, Nida, and Sofia Vitsien, and to my co-authors, Anna Björk and Jurjo Wilson, to Michelle Simone, who did the advanced review for this thesis, and also for Trafik Verket, who have financed uh, much of this research, and in particular, Peter Smeads has been my, my contact person there and been a very good support during the whole work, but there's also a lot of other per persons at Trafik Verket. Lune Carlson and Magnus Johansson at VTI, who have provided very, very, very important guidance for the Samgots model. Uh, and of course, all my friends and colleagues at, here at IHRL and, and other researchers. And yeah, many more with that, but I am there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Albin. <laughs> A small, uh, small applaud from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the small audience, the tiny <laughs> Corona audience here. Um, yes, thank you very much, Albin. With that, I hand over to uh, the word to uh, Maria Oskot. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you, Anna, and thank you, Albin, for this very interesting presentation.